Hi, I'm Caitlin Jenkins, the Family Law Vlogger, and today on the vlog we're going to look at pensions and we're going to think in particular about international pensions. I'm joined, I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague Philip Way, who's one of my Mills and Reed partners, who is a pension expert. And um, Phil, it's a year or so ago since we last did a, did a vlog about pensions and with everything that's been going on, particularly on the international side, we thought it was about time to, to get together again. So pensions uh they've become quite a focus actually i think since the uh the pension advisory group report last year and so we thought we'd unpick two or three international points about pensions to be thinking about and this this blog will be relevant to clients who are thinking about separating or divorcing who've got pensions internationally or, or, or got that sort of cross-jurisdictional bit or professionals who've got clients in that situation so we thought we'd break it down into three sections. The first thing, Phil, we thought we'd look at is for people to think about what to do if they have a pension, but the pension is in a foreign country. So what's, what, what should people be thinking about if they've got that situation? Well, it's an increasingly common one, Caitlin, as you identify, because there's a real proliferation of international families. Um, that's um, a graph that's been going ever upwards over the last few years. Um, and divorce lawyers have seen ever more international cases crossing their desks. And the issue, if you have a couple that are living in England and Wales, and there is an overseas pension in play, is a tricky one. Um, it was illustrated a few years ago um, by the case of a Mr. and Mrs. Goyle, um, where there was a, a pension over in India, and the couple were living in, in England when the marriage broke down. And uh, Mrs. Goyle initially met with success when first she went to court, and uh, the, the, the judge on the first trip out said, yes, um, I will make an injunction against this pension, and Mr. Goyle must transfer his interest in the pension um, to Mrs. Goyle. Uh, Mr. Goyle appealed that all the way up to the Court of Appeal um, and that decision was set aside and sent back to a High Court judge, Mr. Justice Mostyn, to decide what to do with that pension. And there were various submissions made, um, not only by Mrs. Goyle, but by other interested parties um, to say that it should be possible for the English Court to share an overseas pension. Um, but in fact, Mr. Justice Mostyn decided that that was not so and that the uh, pension sharing regime um, does not apply to a pension that is held overseas. Um, that was bad news for Mrs. Goyle. Um, and Mr. Goyle, I would imagine, was pleased with the outcome. Um, but some families, when they're separating, will want to be able to share um, the overseas pension. It, uh, it might be, it wasn't in the Goyles case, but it might be that there are other assets that the pension holder um, wishes to keep hold of. And if he or she isn't able to divide the pension, then the other spouse may well receive a share of assets that the pension holder would prefer to retain. And the good news out of the Goyle case was Mr Justice Mostyn saying, it's one thing finding that the court doesn't have power to share the pension, but if a couple come to the court with an agreement, a consent order, and evidence that the overseas pension provider will implement that consent order, then the court will approve such an arrangement. So where couples are cooperating um, with, with a common aim of sharing an overseas pension, then subject to the overseas pension provider being comfortable with it, it is possible to share it. But the upshot of all of that is it's really important to understand what's the, what's the art of the possible and what isn't possible and therefore so that both the clients and, and those advising them know what, what they can actually achieve and, and if they want to share it in a different way then how they offset that against other assets etc. But the key point is not to assume that that you can share the pension in the foreign country if, if it's not agreed. So um, specialist advice on that early doors and being aware of what the options are is going to be important, isn't it? Absolutely. So the other, the second thing we thought we'd look at is some um, what may, may be a more unusual terminology to some, but is bread and butter for you, I, I appreciate, which is to think about a couple of more unusual parent pe pensions. So first one was a qualifying overseas pension scheme, so a cure ops. And the other thing was a qualifying non-UK pension scheme, a QNUPS. 
So, so what are they and how are they dealt with on divorce? Well, looking at the QROPs first of all, um, that's a pension arrangement that meets specific criteria set out by HMRC. Um, and it's uh, intended for individuals who are, or who plan to be, non-resident in retirement. Mm. Um, it's unsuitable as an arrangement for somebody who is only intending temporarily to move abroad um, post-retirement. Um, but where somebody does have that intention, um, it doesn't have to be established in the new country of residence. Um, it doesn't have to be in the place where the person's going to live. Um, and it is possible to transfer a wide range of pension schemes, including now public sector pension rights, into a QROPS. Um, and as we've just seen, the English court doesn't have jurisdiction over overseas pensions. So somebody may have an English pension, they may be contemplating divorce, and they may be intending to retire overseas transfer their benefits into a QROPS um, and it's almost certain that that is going to uh, be um, protected from the spouse who would otherwise have enjoyed a pension share. So if you have any concerns about pensions being moved um, when a marriage breaks down, it is important to button them down and make sure that they can't be removed to an overseas jurisdiction in the form of a QROPS. That's about keeping the asset in a, an English pension scheme that can then be shared rather than it going off into a QROPS abroad, which, as we've just discussed, can't then be shared unless you agree to deal with it in a particular way, but not, not as of right to be shared. Correct. Correct. And that is one consideration of preserving asset at the point of breakdown of a marriage. Um, but I think you probably I appreciate the focus of this session is international. But as part of that consideration and whether the pension can be shipped off overseas into a QROPS, um, I think it's important to look at all of the other things that could happen. Um, Post-pension freedoms, uh, pension schemes can be stripped out if somebody is bent on that sort of course of action and they can be prevented from doing so uh, by securing an injunction from the court if you have enough evidence of intention that that is about to happen. Um, QNUPs are a very similar um, breed. Um, they won't be susceptible to a pension sharing order either. Um, and um, the, the QNUPs is defined as a pension scheme established in a, a country or territory outside of the UK um, that's recognised for tax purposes under the tax legislation of that country. Um, and unlike a QROPS, a QNUPs needn't be established in a country which has a double taxation agreement with the UK. So that's the tax distinction. Um, but it, for divorce purposes, it falls under the same umbrella of not being capable of sharing. That's excellent. Thank you, Phil, because it's, it's important to know, understand what that terminology is and also what the implications are for the client who's, who's contemplating separation or, or planning a separation. Yeah. That's helpful. So then the third scenario we thought we'd look at is, is, is the opposite of the first one, I suppose. So what to do if you have got divorced outside England or Wales, but you have an English pension. So you have an English pension here and there's something quite time critical about this, isn't there? Where, bearing in mind the forthcoming end of the transitionary period for Brexit. But, but talk us through what the situation is for those pensions. So a divorce outside England and Wales, but the pensions here. Yeah, absolutely. And th this is just as common as the situation of having an overseas pension um, to consider as part of the assets of a family. Um, we get a lot of cases through um, dealing with this point from lawyers overseas. Very often it's a couple that have started out on married life in, in England, um, have gone overseas with work and uh, they find divorce calls and uh, that they need to uh, to share the pension that is cited in England or Wales. What to do? Well, at the moment, um, it's possible under the uh, Matrimonial and Family Proceedings Act of 1984 to obtain an English pension sharing order um, against the, the English pension because English pension providers, it's the reverse of the first scenario that we were talking about, 
English pension providers won't recognise generally um, an overseas pension sharing order in respect of an English pension. Now, a couple can look at the English court to, to deal with the English pension. If they've been divorced overseas, that's the first important point. The person that's applying for the order um, must not have remarried in order to bring the application. And to found jurisdiction, um, one or other of the couple must be domiciled um, in England and Wales, or at the date of the application have been habitually resident here for 12 months. Um, and at the moment, Article 7 of the EU Maintenance Regulation permits jurisdiction um, on the basis that the pension share would represent maintenance for the claiming party. Um, unfortunately, that last jurisdictional ground will disappear at 11pm on the 31st of December 2020, um, with the end of the transitional arrangements for Brexit. And there is the possibility of jurisdiction riding to the rescue, but it doesn't look as though it will dovetail neatly with 11 p.m. on the 31st of December 2020 at the moment. It's very much a case of watch this space. And if there isn't immediate remedial um, legislation, um, the Law Commission's report on enforcement and financial orders um, did make the strong recommendation that the jurisdiction under part three of the act that I referred to, the MFPA of 1984, would be extended beyond um, domicile, habitual residence, to the fact that a, a pension is cited in England and Wales to grant jurisdiction, but that is not with us yet. And there is potentially a vacuum between 11 o'clock at the end of uh, December this year and uh, such legislation riding to the rescue of people who do need an English pension sharing but they live overseas. And so that means really, I mean we're recording this at the end of November, that means that if you are in that situation so you have that scenario that actually it may be really important to, to take advantage of the current situation before the end of December to, to issue some proceedings or at least take advice as to whether that's possible for you and whether there's a, there's a different sort of way of going about it. But um, until we have other legislation, there could be a big gap between what's available right now or might be available. So again, it's a really important area to get advice on. That, that's absolutely right, Kate. And, you know, only this week um, I've had a call from Australia and a couple have separated, but they haven't divorced. Now, whether the Australian divorce process will permit them to divorce very, very rapidly, so that we can put an application in because it's a two-stage uh, process. There's an application for leave um, and once that leave is granted there's then the substantive application and you need to obtain the leave and issue the substantive application before the 31st of December. So timing is important particularly on that one um, but on that one and all of the points that we've discussed and many many more on pensions Specialist advice is really important. Um, and as always, on the Family Law Vlog, we can only touch on the general points. If you need particular advice or you have clients or, or colleagues who need particular advice on these issues, then do get in touch. Um, my details and those of Philip, my colleague Philip Way, will be at the bottom of the vlog in the information. So do feel free to contact us and, and hopefully we can help you some more. But that's it on the vlog today. Thank you very much, Philip, for, for taking the time to explain some of these points and, and talking them through. Thank you. Thank you.